So now that we have introduced, say, at least two different uh, drifts for the discretized forward rate model, so uh, historically called the LIBOR market model, I would like to discuss a little bit the efficient implementation of the drift. So we come now to a um, more implementation specific uh, topic. And uh, really this is quite interesting. Also uh, the paper that discussed this, I, I saw this in a paper by Mark uh, Yoshi, um, is, is not so old yeah? and it came up say, a longer time after the model was used by many different uh, people and industries. Um, and I believe that some already know this trick, yeah, but the trick was published quite, quite late. And that's also a very nice thing because actually this trick saves you a lot of computation time. So the motivation is here, say, let's take a look at the spot measure drift. Yeah, the two are very similar. And uh, I have the formulation here also for the terminal measure. So then you see that what you have to do is you calculate here for all forward rates. So this means for all forward rates is actually an order n. For all forward rates, I have to take the sum over all covariance terms with the other forward rates. And this is also um, of order M. So this guy here is, if I view it for all J, it's an order N squared. Well, you would say, okay, this is a triangle, it's n squared half or n times n minus one half, yeah, because I do not need to look at all combinations, yeah, but it's still an order of n squared. So we see that we have here the con complexity order n squared. And then these guys here are random variables. Yeah, So this here is a random variable. For example, in the model where I have a log normal model, this guy is a sigma i superscript L times L i, right? So there is a random variable. So if you have a Monte Carlo simulation, there is the number of paths inside this uh, random variable. So these could be 100,000 different sample points. So I have order n squared times 100,000 sample points. And remember that n is the period discretization. So n could be something like 80, yeah, if I have say 20 years and quarterly time discretization yeah, or 120 or so on. Yeah. So order n squared is, um, a big number. So my claim is I can remove the n squared and replace it by an n times m, where m is actually much smaller, say something like four. Uh, uh, so you see, you can you can gain a factor of 20 from, from what we will do now. Uh, so this is a significant improvement. Also, if you implement this model, then you will see that it may happen that your code spends a lot of time in the calculation of this drift function. And to do this is also interesting from a mathematical point of view. I need to rewrite uh, the model. And I will rewrite the model in a form that is also very common and which we already used before and which we will use again. Um, and if we rewrite the model in this form, then we can apply a few transformations that allows us to write this term much nicer. Maybe one intuition is that the sum looks a little bit as if 
if i is increasing you have just an additional part in your sum so if you see something like that you should think of the idea okay maybe i can reuse the previous sum in the next sum but this is not the case because i'm taking here the covariance from i to j so there is the row i j so whenever i change the i i will take a different line in my covariance matrix so you see that this is not possible to decouple this so easily uh, but it has something to do with the covariance structure and for that reason i wrote here the drift in a slightly different form so you you know that um, this part here is just the rho i j dt and then you could actually drop the dt on both sides but now here i just wrote the drift in the form that was part of the derivation before we plugged in the dw dw equals blah blah dt uh, before we did the step it's on the left hand side comparing coefficients mu dt equals this expression because i would like to rewrite reformulate these brownian motions in a different form and the form is important so what i do is i assume that okay assume is a little bit big word because i can always do this i assume that the brownian motion with the correlation is represented so this guy here is represented through factor loadings so i have a sum f i k d u k where the d u k are independent brownian motions so I represent the correlated Brownian motions with independent Brownian motions. Duk dul is dt if k is equal to l, otherwise it's zero. Fik, so I have a factor in front of the independent Brownian motion. Fik is then sometimes called the factor loading and the sum so the scalar product of the line uh, fik for different k's and the vector the uk um, is uh, giving me the dw uh, you can also write this in a matrix notation so that would be dw is f times du and f is now a matrix that has n rows because i have n different dw's and m columns because important thing is i assume that here i have an m which is different from n so this here is an n times m matrix so if you do this then you can easily derive what is rho yeah so i know that uh, rho i j dt this is just the dwi dwj now if you plug in here for dwi the definition this is the factor loading fik and for dwj the definition this is the factor loading f j k so i use different case because if i now take all combinations of the factors i will get here the double sum the sum over k2 and the sum over k1 all combinations f i k1 f j k2 d u k1 d u k2 but you know that this here is zero for k1 not equal k2 so you see the double sum is actually a single sum it's just the scalar product of f i and fj so the sum fik fjk so you see that this stuff here is my rho so if you write this now in matrix notation yeah if you have um, say a correlation matrix r yeah, then you see that the correlation matrix is 
F times F transpose. So F has um, M columns. So it's a row vector of M elements multiplied transposed. Now it has M uh, rows multiplied with a column vector of M rows. So it's here this nice little scalar product of the row and the column that only runs up to M. I said, I assume I can represent the row, but you can always do this. So the um, thing is that this is always possible. Yeah, this is just the Cholesky decomposition of the matrix R, yeah, which you can do uh, derive from an eigenvalue decomposition. Um, so this representation of the correlation matrix here uh, with a factor matrix F, where R is equal to F times F transposed is always possible. And the M that I need in this matrix is just the rank of the matrix matrix R. So it means that um, eigenvectors comparing to eigenvalues zero can be dropped yeah? Yeah, because they will not contribute to the uh, Brown emotion. So, I always have the possibility to rewrite my Brownian motion in this form. And now I would like to rewrite my model using these guys in place of the DW. So this means I consider now my model in an equivalent form. So I consider now my model. So this was equation 100 when we introduced the model. I consider this now in this form, an E2 process mu i dt plus sigma i dwi, but the dwi is now given with the factor loadings. Okay, and if you now define lambda i k to be equal sigma i f i k, you can write this here as a sum with lambda i k d u k. Yeah? So just recall, I have here a sigma i, so in, in, instead of this here, I have a sigma i d w i, so this is a sigma i, the sum f i k d u k, and then I move the sigma i inside. So this is now my sigma i f i k. So, but this I define as the lambda, lambda i k d u k. And these guys are now called my factor loadings, lambda i k. And you also maybe remember that sometimes in the implementation, I like to use the model in this form. Yeah, we have a few relations. So I have the relation that f i k f j k taking the sum over all k gives me the rho but we also have the relation that taking the sum lambda i k lambda j k is the sigma i f i k sigma j f j k sum over all k rho i j. Yeah, so that's nice. So you see that this covariance expression which appears in the drift is the scalar product of the i vector of this lambda matrix and the j vector of this lambda matrix. So now I can rewrite the drift using my lambda i lambda j, sigma i sigma j rho i j is replaced here by this sum k from one to m lambda i k lambda j k. Okay, so now you think, okay, I, I wanted to make the thing more efficient, but actually this is less efficient. Uh, okay, it's less efficient because I still have for every i, 
I need to sum over all j, so this is order n squared. And now I need to sum here over all factors m. So this is order n m squared times m. So it doesn't, doesn't look so efficient. The thing is that now I can achieve a little bit this decoupling, which we were talking about, uh, because let me flip the two sums. So let's move the sum that sums over all k in front. So that, that's okay. So then I have a double sum over all k and all j. And then you see that you can move the lambda i k in front of this sum. So you have, this is the sum over all factors k, lambda i k multiplied with inside summing over all j, lambda j k and this uh, factor um, delta j dosh one uh, divided by, sorry. Delta J divided by one plus Delta J, LJ. Okay, and remember that in my motivation, the issue was that if this sum here increases with another I, then I cannot reuse the previous sum because inside of the previous sum, there was a dependency on the I. Yeah, so that was the issue here. If you increase the sum by one index, you cannot reuse the previous sum because inside there is a dependency on the i. This thing is now gone. Inside here, if you increase the index i, all the things that you sum here are the same as the previous one plus an additional one. So actually calculating this sum here is not order n squared. For every n, so for every i, do a new sum. It is just order n. Take the previous sum and add one element, uh, which is order one, but for every, for every n, uh, so it's order n. So that is the trick. So by this decoupling, I could make this sum here independent of i, and then there's a factor that depends on the i here in front. Yeah, wow, that's nice. So the drift can be written as the sum from k equals one to m, lambda i k multiplied with this inner sum. So this inner sum is now my alpha i k. So my alpha i k is this sum that has the partial uh, part of the factor loading. So it's the sum delta j divided by one plus delta j lj, lambda j k. I have to remember this sum for all k. So calculating these guys here is order n times m. Yeah? So if I do this for all i, this is order n m. Why? Yeah, because for the next i, I can just reuse the previous one. So the sum is actually not the issue here. And this guy here is order n times m, because for every i, I have to perform a sum over m different elements. Yeah. <coughs> so maybe I write the for all here. So I have two different summations, both n times n, m. So it's two times n times m. Yeah? So it's order n times m. So nice thing, the original calculation was order n squared, but now my calculation is order n times n. I can just update the second sum. So we have a very nice feature. I can just update here in the calculation of the second sum, the next alpha i is the previous alpha i plus one summation term delta i divided by one plus delta i li lambda i k. 
and you initially start with a zero. Uh, for the terminal measure, you can do the same. You remember that the terminal measure has just um, small differences. So there is the minus here. Okay, so this means now I just define here this partial sum. So this inner sum with also a minus. So that's just a difference. And the summation is running over um, a different interval. So this beta IK is defined here with a different index set. And you see that you have the same property, but now you can go backward. Yeah, The sum is running from I to N. And if you go backward, so here I was going forward. Next I is the previous I plus an additional part of the sum. And here it goes just backward. So it is better for i minus one and k can be defined as better for i k. Yeah, it's the same sum here with just one additional additional part. So I'm going, going backward. Um, also note that there is a small other difference for the terminal measure, we had that in this sum, the term J equals I is not included. So you see that here I is not equal J. So I just have all the future rates without the I. For the spot measure, the I is included. So I have all the rates, including the I. So this means um, I have to calculate here first alpha IK with a new part of the sum. And then I have to plug this in here. But here, if I would like to perform the update, it means that I plug in the better IK that does not contain here the I, and then I add the term that has the I to the better. So it's a little bit, the um, update rule comes one step later for the terminal measure. Okay, so uh, three small differences, different sign, different indices, yeah? so running backward instead of forward, and the update comes after I have calculated the I for the terminal measure, but for the spot measure, it comes before. Yeah, let's uh, look at the implementation. Yeah, so I can very easily implement this. Summary here for the spot measure, I set this sum for every K, I have to calculate the sum. I set it initially to zero and then I perform the update for the um, spot measure. I have that the alpha K has to contain the term I that I'm currently looking at. So I perform the update before, and then I calculate here this uh, sum, lambda I K alpha K. So this sum is a calculation of order M. This update here is a calculation of order M. And I'm doing that for all rates. So this is order N. Yeah? So I have N times M. And the same for the terminal measure, I set all betters to zero. And then since my sum should not contain the term uh, where uh, better has in the summation, the factor related to the rate I, I first perform this summation. And there you also see that the last rate has drift zero because I'm summing with a drift that is zero. Okay, 
So in term the measure, the last forward rate, yeah, so I go backward here. I start with the last one, here's drift zero, it's a martingale. Then I put this expression into the beta. So I update it with the summation. You also see that there is the minus here instead of the plus. And I go backward over all indices. And I have the calculation also in n times m. So here I have code that does this. And let me maybe go quickly through the code. Um, first thing is the code fits on one slide. Well, it's maybe a bit small, but there is a little bit of boilerplate stuff. So um, what are we doing here? So the first part here is that I request the time discretization. So here I'm calculating the T and I'm also calculating this um, T M T plus one. So the index where my summation maybe should start, you know, the first, first forward rate index. Then I somehow also initialize the drift to zero. So summation will be done below. So this is the drift mu j. And here I'm initializing the alpha k or beta k. Yeah, so both variables have here in the code the same name also to zero. So this variable is here called the factor loading sum. And the other guy is here the drift, yeah, which I initialized to zero. And then comes the two parts. So this here is the spot measure part. And this here is the terminal measure part. Uh, depending on which measure was chosen, there are these two parts. Okay, so let's have a closer look to this. So what are we doing? Uh, I ask my model here for the period length. This is my delta J. I ask my model here for the forward rate. Actually, the forward rate comes as an argument to this function. So this here is my LJ. And then I calculate this strange term that appears in front of the um, factor in this sum of the drift. So this here is the delta J divided by one plus LJ delta j. So this guy is called the one step measure transform because it is actually the change of measure from one time point to the next time point uh, that is related to this term. Then I'm asking for the factor loading. So you see here the function get factor loading. So this factor loading here is my lambda j k. So actually it's a lambda j because uh, this is a vector, so I can remove here maybe the j, uh, the k, sorry. Then I'm calculating the sum lambda j with the uh, one step, step measure transform. So this here is calculating the factor loadings sum. This here is the update for the alpha. Yeah? So this here is the, the update rule. Alpha K gets an update. So plus the one step measure transform multiplied with the factor loading. So alpha K is alpha K plus this delta J divided by one plus LJ. Delta J lambda J K. Okay, and then I'm calculating the drift. So I'm calculating here the sum that mu J is mu J plus. So you see, this is this factor loading sum. So this is my alpha j sorry, my alpha k times the factor loading 
the lambda. Oh, sorry, this is index i, right? Here, yeah, this is index i. Lambda alpha k times lambda i k now. Okay, so that's that's the update rule. So you see a very, very short code. All this stuff is operating here, of course, on random variables. So if you have a big Monte Carlo simulation, everything is done on a sample vector of 100,000, 1 million passes. So all these uh, arithmetic operations, which you have here, so um, add the sum uh, are defined in our class, which performs operations on uh, random variables. So that is the thing for the spot measure. For the terminal measure, you see there is uh, very few differences. There is the difference that we have here, this minus in this factor. So there you spot the minus. And there is the difference that I first calculate the drift and then I'm updating the beta. Okay, so this is the other way around compared to here. And of course, instead of running forward, through the loop. So this here is the loop that runs forward. So you see there's a plus plus here. Now I run here backward through the loop. So I start with the last index and there's a minus minus here. So I run backward. So these are just the two differences between the, the measures and a very efficient, very short code to calculate the drift. That was it for today. Thank you.